I would like to briefly review the agenda for this webinar. First, I will explain how to submit a question to our presenter. Then, Rebecca Roper, Director of the Practice-Based Research Network Initiative at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, will introduce today's presenter. We will then hear from our presenter a detailed overview of the Pragmatic Explanatory Continuum Indicator Summary. Our presenter is open to receiving questions throughout his presentation and will be available to answer questions at the end of his presentation as well. At the end of the webinar, I will explain how to obtain CME credit for participation in this webinar. Please note that after today's webinar, a copy of the presentation slides will be emailed to all webinar participants. Please note, if at any point during this, sorry, please note that today's presenter does not have any financial relationships to disclose. Additionally, he will not discuss off-label use and or investigational use of medications in his presentation. I will now explain how to submit a question to today's presenter. To submit a question, you may use the GoToWebinar control panel. Type a question under the questions section and hit send as shown in the screenshot on this slide. You may submit a question at any time throughout the presentation. During the Q&A session, as time allows, your questions will be read out loud and our presenter will respond. I will now turn the presentation over to Ms. Roper. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, earlier this year, uh, Rowena Delore suggested that we have a presentation about pre -C, and we promptly reached out to Professor Thorpe, and he uh, obliged. Now, one thing in reflecting about Rowena's uh, suggestion, um, her, her initials are R&D, Rowena Delore for Research and Development. So we are um, benefit of her um, responses to us and suggestions, and that is a good plug for when we ask for suggestions of other topics or we ask for feedback, please do let us know what you as the PBRN community need. We seek to meet your needs. This is the last national webinar in calendar year 2014, but we have nine more months to go under the current uh, Resource Center. We look forward to um, providing you uh, informative discussions. So Professor Thorpe um, is a biostatistician methodologist with over 20 years of experience in research, clinical trials, and data management. Currently he works at the Applied Health Research Center, AHRC, at the King Shing Knowledge Institute at St. Michael's Hospital, and is an assistant professor in the Dalai Lama School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. His research interests focus on the design and analysis of clinical trials in addition to statistical education. So uh, we are beneficial of the community village uh, that, of learning that Canada is providing to us. Um, Franz Laguerre made us all aware of the name. Uh, Canada means village and we are uh, grateful to the village of sharing that our PBRN brethren from Canada engage with us down here below the Great Lakes region. So before we turn it over to Dr. Thorpe to give this in-depth presentation, we're just going to uh, execute a poll. Please let us know whether or not you have used the Precis tool in your work and select yes or no. Thank you. So while you're giving that feedback to us, um, Christina will set up the um, view so Professor Thorpe can take us through a very in-depth presentation about precis and the continuum of choices in deciding what question you want to answer and how you will conduct your research to pose that question and get the answer needed. So um, about a third of you have used this in the past and most of you have not. So we're so glad that you're here with us today. Um, Professor Thorpe. Okay, I'll well, just uh, thank you for, uh, for attending today. So I'm going to uh, take you through uh, in, some, in some depth this tool. Um, but first we'll, we'll have an introduction about it, the, the purpose of it in general, uh, discuss what pragmatic and explanatory trials are. Then we'll go into each of the pieces of it in some detail. Um, which will take the bulk of the time, then we can quickly proceed through two examples of 
this being applied to two trials. Uh, just and some brief discussion slides, and that will about wrap it up. Professor, so this is sorry. It looks like your screen isn't being shared right now. Do you have a pop-up box asking to share your screen? No, it didn't pop up. Okay. So could you go to the top of the the dashboard and under screen sharing, click share my screen? There we go. Thank you. So that was, you just missed the table of contents. All right. So randomized trials in the past have been considered or called either effectiveness or efficacy. Um, terms I don't particularly like. They don't convey, they, they sound so similar and it's always difficult I find to keep sorted out in one's mind which is which. Long time ago now, back in 1967, uh, Schwartz and Lelouch described two approaches to trial design. And they, at that time, coined the terms pragmatic and explanatory. Um, I prefer those. They're considerably more uh, transparent, I think, in terms of what they're achieving. And the thing to note is these two terms, pragmatic and explanatory, they relate to the purpose of a clinical trial. And I'll get to that purpose shortly. The final thing about this is the authors clearly link a trial's purpose with its structure. So the way in which you do things in a particular trial are going to align with ultimately some purpose of the trial. So to get us all on the same page, we'll consider two definitions. And they're fairly broad and idealistic definitions, but they, they get the idea across. A pragmatic trial seeks to answer the question, does an intervention work under usual conditions? That is just simply what it does. The explanatory trial seeks to answer the question, can an intervention work under ideal conditions? And you know, that is the extreme examples and extreme positions of, of the two designs. Um, it's also important to note that it's not the case that one design is superior to the other design. They each have their, their purposes within the realm of, of research. The choice of a trial design depends on ultimately what a particular investigator wishes to achieve with what they wish to understand at the trial's conclusion. So there is place for, for both. There is not, it's not a case of one should be used to the exclusion of the other. Now, why does the distinction in the type of trial matter? One important reason is it matters for the interpretation of a trial's results. And here are two examples of how that takes place. A, and a positive explanatory trial, so that's one where you conclude a difference between your treatment groups, for example, it's not proof that its intervention will work in usual practice. Whereas a negative explanatory trial very strongly suggests that it wouldn't work in usual practice. So the, the reasoning here is typically, as we'll see, the explanatory trial is under very idealistic conditions, under uh, very t you know, tight controls for eligibility and whatnot. And so just because it works under that condition doesn't necessarily mean under a more general usual, usual practice type of scenario where there's a whole lot more noise, a whole lot less that you have control over, that you would see a positive effect in that environment. But if you can't, have an inter if you can't get an intervention to work under the idealized scenario, it's very unlikely that you would show it works in, in the general scenario. On the other side, a positive pragmatic trial you know, strongly suggests that intervention would work in the ideal setting, where you take tighter controls, you pick people who are going to respond, all these sorts of things are characteristic of the explanatory design. If it works in a pragmatic usual care, it's likely going to work as well in that, in that explanatory setting. But the negative pragmatic trial it doesn't mean that there is not a condition in which a trial, the, the intervention would work, a more idealized, more controlled setting, a different patient population, et cetera. So 
understanding whether a trial's aim and design is more explanatory or pragmatic is very important for uh, putting the results of that particular trial into an appropriate context. Uh, another aspect of it is the pragmatic trials tend to be slightly more generalized than the uh, explanatory trials. And so for that reason, sometimes people think they are, they are better. It just helps you to understand and interpret the results more accurately or more appropriately. Now, labels have a problem. To just blindly, blithely call a trial pragmatic or explanatory, it's really an oversimplification, and it implies there's a dichotomy. There are so many moving parts in a clinical trial that it's pretty naive to think that we are that simple. There's really a continuum of, continuum of options between extreme cases of either type. So there's all sorts of uh, gray zones in between that are neither pure explanatory or pragmatic. And furthermore, there's many decisions made for a given trial, each of which is more pragmatic or explanatory than another. So what you're, we're really faced with is rather than a simple dichotomy, pragmatic or explanatory, we have a really a multi-dimensional continuum of possibilities. And so over a period of, uh, of a few years, we developed this, what we've called the Pragmatic Explanatory Continuum Indicator Summary, okay, or PRAC for short. And it, we described 10 domains in which trial decisions are made that affect the degree to which a trial is pragmatic or explanatory. And these are the 10 that we came up with. So to do with patient eligibility criteria, experimental intervention flexibility, practitioner expertise in the experimental arm, comparison intervention, practitioner expertise in the comparison arm. We talk about follow-up intensity, the primary outcome of the trial, participant compliance, practitioner adherence, and the analysis of the primary outcome. Um, so that takes the end of that first section. Um, I saw there were some questions that did pop up, so we can take a quick break to see if there's any questions to deal with at this point uh, to help clarify what's been said. Uh, we didn't have a question so much as just an observation, which is consistent with some of the statements that you made, Professor Thorpe, and I'll, quote, I'll recite it to you. A negative explanatory trial that excludes, for whatever reason, the people most likely to benefit can be negative, but a pragmatic trial that includes those people can be positive. So um, it's just an offering an example of, of differences in composition. Is there anything else that you care to follow up with that, Professor Thorpe? Um, I guess it's possible, the, it, but it might not necessarily be that it's pragmatic. It just happens to include the group that's going to benefit. So, I mean, that's, I mean, an explanatory trial that doesn't include the group to benefit will not be successful. Um, a pragmatic trial would probably include those people as well as those who would be likely to benefit. Um, and it's conceivable you might see something there, but it's, it really depends on, on the distribution of these things, the noise that is involved with, with all of that going on. And you know, we have to remember that inferences from clinical trials are really about averages. And on average, you might not see something in the population, but there could be subgroups within the population which could benefit. So I think that's the, that's the distinction. And, and none of these are, you know, things are never 100% in statistics. Uh, one of the things I will say is the only thing that's certain about statisticians is we're never certain about anything. And okay. so that you know, is the way, you know, the way some of these things go. Great. A uh, second question was posed with respect to applicability of the PRECES. Is PRECES relevant to both experimental and observational studies? Um, I haven't really thought about it in terms of observational studies. It's it's very much geared and intended towards design of a of the of randomized trials. Um, so that that's that's where it's 
our thought processes are haven't really you know a number of the things in there you've got other issues in uh, observational studies you're not controlling for lots of things for example so there so I, I would be a little bit wary about trying to use it to grade and plan a, an observational study. It's really designed around trials. Great. Thank you. I think with that, we'll turn it uh, solely to you, uh, Professor Thorpe, to give us the details about the precincts. OK. So we're going to go through each domain in some detail. To, and the basic approach to all of these domains is you and the way you uh, you would apply this, you're going to apply it uh, ideally in a design framework when you're trying to come up with your trial. And the way to think about all of these decisions is you consider the most extreme positions in perhaps both directions, and then the degree to which you move away from a particular extreme, you, you move along the continuum. Um, so consider four steps of trial design. And it's important to decide up front whether your primary purpose is to deliver a pragmatic or explanatory trial. Because then you, know, you want to know what your target is. So specify the settings or conditions for which the trial is intended to be applicable. Specify the design options at the pragmatic and explanatory extremes of each domain. Decide how pragmatic explanatory the trial is in relationship to those extremes for each domain. And that's done by considering addition or removal of restrictions that shift the trial's position along the continuum. And as we'll see, the result of this assessment can be displayed graphically, which uh, has sort of a nice, uh, a nice impact for, a nice impact factor for the degree of pragmatism or explanatoriness of your trial. And so the idea is we we have a, a diagram like this, explanatory is in the middle, pragmatics on the outside, and you, you basically put a mark along each of those lines for each dimension that represents how far away it is from each of those extremes, and you connect them up, and what you end up with is a very pragmatic trial tends to have a very wide uh, focus, and a, an explanatory trial tends to be very tight around the hub. And it lets you very easily sort of see anomalies from your plan design. If you had a, an explanatory design, but with some things way out at the edge, you can, you can pick those out. Whether or not you want to do anything about it is another story. Um, similarly, if you were aiming for pragmatic and you see a couple things that have crept in towards the middle, it's something you can take a look at. So let's start with participant eligibility. The most extremely pragmatic approach to eligibility seeks to identify study participants with a condition of interest from as many sources as possible. So the idea here is you identify your, your population of interest, the disease of interest, whatever it may be, and you accept all comers with the condition of interest from wherever you can find them. And that sort of is the most extreme condition possible. Study populations can be restricted in the, with, by doing a number of the following things. You might exclude participants not known or shown to be highly compliant to interventions under study. So what that is, is by restricting it to patients um, who are more, more likely to be compliant with the interventions under study. That takes it a bit away from a pragmatic end high risk for the trial outcome. Um, so by excluding patients not at high risk, it becomes a little bit more explanatory. Um, typically in your high, and the reason for that is in a high risk setting, someone who's got a high risk of the outcome or, you know, they have some bad outcome in general, it's easier in some respects to show differences in those environments. You know, uh, because you just have a whole lot more room to go. Uh, to identify treatment effects. When you're dealing with a very low risk population with event rates that are extremely low, for example, it's very, very difficult to go lower than very low. So you need very large sample sizes and detect very small effects. So that's, that's the rationale behind that 
Um, an explanatory trial would tend to keep participants that are expected to be highly responsive to the intervention. Again, maximizing the ability to show an effect if it's there. A small number of sources for participants tends to be more explanatory. It becomes less and less generalizable in a sense as your patient pool and your selection becomes narrower and narrower. And that's the general concept in participant eligibility. The broader the inclusion, the less restrictions on who comes in, the more pragmatic it is. The more restrictions you place, the more explanatory it becomes. So the flexibility of the intervention. A pragmatic approach leaves the details of how to implement an experimental intervention up to the practitioners. It doesn't dictate what co-interventions to use or how to deliver them. It, you basically place the intervention in the hand of the practitioners and say, you know, use it as you see fit. Flexibility can be restricted in a number of ways. You might have specific direction for administering it, you know, dosing schedules, surgical tactics, etc. You might specify the timing that the intervention is to be delivered to maximize its effect, if such thing is known. Restrictions and types of co-interventions that are allowed, particularly if they could dilute an effect. Uh, giving specific direction for how to apply those co-interventions. You know, they're not left to their own devices to apply how they see fit. You say you can only do such and such under such and such conditions. And specific directions for managing com complications and side effects from the intervention. Um, I, sh I should just mention that none of these that none of these slides are intended to be exhaustive in the types of things, but it's really to give a flavor of the types of restrictions one might see going from pragmatic to explanatory. Not all trials are going to do all, all of these, but the idea is the more things you've done to restrict, the more explanatory it becomes. And you see that in this case that the nature of the restrictions are placing tighter and tighter control over the delivery of the intervention, making it more, a much more homogeneous intervention, but it then deviates for how an intervention might be applied in practice. Next, we're talking about the expertise of those giving the intervention, the experimental intervention. The pragmatic approach is to put it in the hands of anyone who's going to be treating patients like those you're targeting in the study. Practitioner choice can be restricted. You might restrict it to those who have some experience with the intervention, length of time work, working in subjects like the ones enrolled in the trial. Um, if it's a surgical intervention, for example, they might have to do a certain number of surgeries. Another level of restriction is requiring some certification appropriate to the intervention. Um, so this is, again, a surgical example. If an intervention has been in use without a trial, experience with the intervention could be required. A final level, <coughs> excuse me, only practitioners who are deemed to have sufficient experience in the opinion of the trial investigator, we invite to participate. So this is this is sort of hand selecting those who are thought to be the, the best candidates to perform the intervention. And so you go from all possible practitioners to very specific criteria for who is participating in a trial. We can consider the comparison intervention in similar terms to the experimental. And we separated these two out because it's conceivable one could have a tight intervention on, you know, tight controls on experimental intervention, but have a more usual care comparator. And so, but you can tweak both at the same time. Pragmatic trials would typically compare an intervention to usual practice, or whatever that is, or the best available alternate, alternative management strategy as per guidelines but it's not otherwise going to dictate the details of the intervention. You just trust your, you know, you're, you're trying in a sense to not intervene with what's already being done. That is the most pragmatic approach. You can do restrictions in a similar manner to the explanatory, uh, 
to the uh, experimental intervention. One other thing to note, there are times when an explanatory trial may use a placebo rather than the best alternative management strategies comparator. And so it would probably not be particularly pragmatic to introduce a placebo when it comes to a pill. If they weren't getting that before, you introduce that now, it becomes a little bit less pragmatic. Um, it's not unheard of, but it's not going to be at the most pragmatic end. So now we consider the practitioner expertise in the comparison group, and it mirrors the uh, experimental practitioners. You would again accept the usual practitioners in the setting of interest, and restrictions follow a similar path as with the experimental intervention. The next deals with follow-up intensity. In trials you tend to follow up patients over time in order to obtain their outcomes. A pragmatic position would not seek follow-up contact with study participants in excess of usual practice for the practitioner. In fact, in some pragmatic trials, you can have no further contact with the patients. Um, a case of that is where you have administrative databases you can use in order to obtain outcomes from. You can obtain certain patient outcomes using administrative data with, uh, without ever seeing the patients again. Now, the extent to which your increased follow-up intensity could lead to things such as increased compliance or improved intervention response. Follow-up intensity moves toward the explanatory end. So follow-up visits, time frames are pre-specified in the protocol. It's a very common thing to do. <clears throat> These are more frequent than would typically occur outside the trial. So the follow-up is more intense. The possible implication of that, with more intense follow-up, you might, that follow, more intense follow-up could be a form of intervention in and of itself. The extra monitoring a patient gets might result in different responses than had they been left alone. Additional follow-ups are triggered by outcome events. Additional visits are triggered by intervening events that could lead to an outcome event prophylactic scheduled visits in a sense. Patients are contacted, they fail to keep appointments, so trying to maximize uh, adherence to uh, visit schedules. And more extensive data collected, particularly intervention-related data, than would be typical outside the trial. So intensity of follow-up involves both frequency of visits and it, and it also involves the intensity and, and bulk of data collection. The primary outcome. The explanatory, so, the, so it's easier in some ways to think of this one going from the explanatory end towards pragmatic. An explanatory approach considers the primary outcome that the experimental intervention is expected to have a direct effect on. The most explanatory position is, is considering an event that is very close, say, on the causal pathway of the intervention that is being considered. So that you know, if the intervention has any effect on that very, very close pro proximal event, that would be important to see the further downstream events might be less likely to show an effect even with the effect up close. You know, biomarkers, or, uh, you know, biomarkers and surrogate outcomes are examples of this sort of thing as well. Um, other things you might have in the explanatory approach, central adjudication of the outcome um, or assessment might require special training and tests not normally used to apply outcome definition criteria. So a, a very explanatory outcome you know, would have machinery involved in the trial that's not normally present in usual care. This central adjudication idea, um, special training, tricky definitions, that kind of thing. 
a pragmatic approach is usually going to consider patient important outcomes that can be readily measured and not require adjudication. <coughs> so, you know, patient mortality is a pretty patient-centric outcome that doesn't require a lot of special skill to measure. A pragmatic trial might also consider much longer follow-up periods for outcome assessment to see if it works. The explanatory you might be looking at a at a much more proximal endpoint. So the next two domains talk about participant compliance and practitioner adherence. So one of them is focused. This one, participant compliance, is focused on the on the research subjects, those who are getting the intervention. And it's a, it, it's a peculiar thing. Um, measurement of compliance may have the possibility of actually altering compliance, which is going to then improve responsiveness. So a pragmatic approach would not be to measure or use compliance information in any way. The more rigorous a trial is in measuring responding to non-compliance, the more explanatory it becomes. And so consider a, a range of options. Compliance measured indirectly for descriptive purposes at the conclusion of the trial is probably a fairly minor deviation. We get more severe here. Compliance data measured and fed back to providers and participants during follow-up. So you measure it and you tell them how they're doing. Uh, you have Uniform compliance improving strategies apply to all participants. So there are things built into the trial to help all participants improve their compliance. And then you also have additional strategies, perhaps to deal with poor compliers to increase their so responding to non-compliance. So the, the degree to which you're doing more and more with compliance to improve compliance in a trial, the more explanatory it becomes. Now this next one, the practitioner adherence, is all about those delivering your intervention, of sort of a working with your research protocol. And it's, it's about how they adhere to the written protocol or how much they go off page. <coughs> so a purely pragmatic approach wouldn't be concerned about how practitioners vary or customize their trial protocol to suit their setting. So you know, the protocol is taken as a sort of what you would like them to do, and you allow them to apply and customize it as appropriate for their setting. But by monitoring and acting on non-adherence, it becomes more explanatory. These ideas mirror little bits of participant compliance. You might measure adherence indirectly for descriptive purposes. Not likely to have much effect, but it's less pragmatic then you do feedback of, of adherence, slightly more invasive. You have strategies applied across the board. You have additional strategies to deal with poor compliance or poor adherence. So finally, we get to the analysis of the primary outcome. Now the pragmatic approach is typically the intention to treat analysis of an outcome of direct relevance in study participants. Um, the intent to treat is the idea where whatever patients were randomized to, whether or not they complied, they are analyzed according to the group they were randomized to. Now there are exceptions to this. When you're dealing with other certain, you know, trial designs such as non-inferiority and, and uh, equivalence designs, an intent to treat is generally not the right analysis for those because it's going to bias in favor of the alternatives in those cases. The intent to treat is sort of thought generally in the superiority design, and it biases in that case towards the null hypothesis of no difference, which is why it's done. You don't want to conclude something works when in fact it doesn't. Um, so all that is just for a, just to be a completeness and statistically accurate, I suppose. Now, intention to treat also the norm for explanatory trials. 
There are also various restrictions that may additionally be employed to address an explanatory question, can this intervention work under ideal conditions? So you might exclude those non-compliant participants. Uh, you exclude post, ineligible post-randomization, non-adherent practitioners, multiple subgroup analyses planned for groups thought to have the largest treatment effect. So you'd have a variety of pre-planned analyses that are aimed to look at that explanatory question to control or remove those things that are, are a nuisance to seeing the treatment effect if it's there. All right, so that's a dense few slides, uh, I realize, so look, we can take a few minutes now to pause for some questions on those. Sure. Um, Professor Thorpe, if you go back to slide 19, and I believe this is the slide to which the um, speak, speaker was posing, would you please provide an example for bullet one? Compliance measured indirectly. So it might be as simple as uh, measuring whether, you know, just keeping track of who showed up for their scheduled appointments or not doing anything about it. So that would, in a sense, that would be one form of compliance that you might take a look at. Especially if the, if the intervention was something that was delivered at multiple visits over the course of time, an indirect measure of compliance would be you know, measuring how many appointments were missed, but you don't do anything with it other than report at the end of the trial. Okay, thank you. And we have another question. In a pragmatic approach, aren't you unnecessarily losing the advantages of an intention to treat strategy by ignoring loss to follow up? Which you address later after this person posed the question and then the statement is made, here it seems to me you may be applying pragmatism to running the trial rather than to maximizing generalizability. Um, I don't have, I don't think I've talked about sort of running the trial moment. What was um, I might not be understanding the question, but the the idea here is you're sort of thinking about what are you going to regiment in terms of the trial design. Um, and how you are going to obtain outcomes from individuals, how you're going to measure the outcomes, the degree in which those are going to be invasive and, pot and potentially um, uh, affect performance. Um, loss to follow-up is a problem no matter what, and it has to be thought carefully how to maximize completeness of your data no matter what the case. What the case. The questions of pragmatism are really how much and how well can your trial mimic what goes on in usual practice in real world settings compared to uh, really highly experimental conditions. And so I said, you know, lost a follow up if you know, sort of not seeing the patients again might be fine if your outcome is such that it can be measured without actually contacting the patient. So the example I used was mortality from um, administrative databases, you know, vital statistics, those kinds of things. So in those cases, you're not getting it, it's not lost to follow up. You're measuring the outcome in a non-invasive manner, but obviously you are not going to be able to measure lots of other outcomes in that way. So it becomes very focused on the particular outcome you're trying to get to. I don't know if that answered the question that was being posed, or if I misunderstood it. If, uh, if so, the, the person who posed the question, if they could rephrase it, and we'll, we'll ask Professor Thorpe at the next interval. Um, and I think we can go back to your next section, Professor Thorpe. Thank you. Okay, so back, so we're going to consider uh, two examples of two different trials. 
and these were sort of both done in the in the paper, um, the, the original Tracy article. So I'm going to focus on this one first, called DOT, and it's directly observed treatment of tuberculosis. Um, so it's the trial of self-supervised and directly observed treatment of tuberculosis. So here's a, also it's, it's what its question was. Among South African adults with newly diagnosed pulmonary tuberculosis, this five times weekly direct observation of pill swallowing by a nurse in the clinic compared to self-administration, increased the probability that patients will take more than 80% of doses within seven months of starting treatment with no interruption to more than two weeks. The experimental intervention was self-administration, and the comparison was DOT, which is why I use in South Africa. So it's a, it's a curious situation. The, the way uh, tuberculosis medicine had been given in South Africa, out of concern that patients weren't going to take it if they left with it, is a nurse would watch the patients in clinic actually take and swallow their pills for tuberculosis. So that was the standard of care. And so the experimental intervention here was to give the patients the medication to take with them and take on their own. So it's important to understand that. Otherwise, the whole thing sounds a little bit strange here. So let's go through each of the 10 domains and see how they were treated in this trial. Eligibility criteria. So all comers receiving care for newly diagnosed tuberculosis to clinics. So the all comers is very pragmatic, but two clinics puts it not at the extreme edge. If they could have recruited for more sites, it could have been more pragmatic. The intervention flexibility. Melf, the method of self-administration was left to the individual patient. And they could delegate weekly drug collection visits to a family member. So what that means is the patient could take it however they wanted. There was, you know, they weren't told what to do with it, just you know, take it. So they could have done it all sorts of ways, I suppose. So it's extremely pragmatic in the approach. The expertise for the experimental. So in terms of the treatment, all clinic nurses were involved, no particular specialization or additional training, and patients were self-treating with no special training. So that's pretty pragmatic. For the comparison group, clinics already had direct observation in place, and so that practice was not altered in any way. They were left for those patients to do it exactly as it always does. There was no difference made there in practice, so it's extremely pragmatic in that respect. The practitioner expertise in the comparison group, all clinic nurses were involved. There's no particular specialization or additional training. They already had the skills, so extremely pragmatic on that arm. The follow-up intensity. No extra clinic visits were scheduled. So if they were doing the direct observation, they came to the clinic when they were supposed to. Uh, experimental alarm, no visits whatsoever were required, since even the weekly drug collection could be delegated to a family member. So what that means is that once you gave the patient the medication, they might not even ever need to come back to the clinic. They could send their information with a family member. So you know, that's the extreme approach to follow-up intensity. The outcome, outcome successful treatment, which included all patients who were cured and all patients who completed the treatment. All patients were followed for a year until they completed the treatment, died or were classified as incompletely treated, or were lost to follow-up. So it's a very pragmatic approach to the primary outcome. Compl participant compliance. It's a bit, this is a bit of a funny one, but compliance was an element of the outcomes, and so it was measured for that purpose, but it wasn't used otherwise to improve the patient compliance. So there wasn't feedback to the patient saying, you know, you really should take more of your pills. It's pragmatic, but obviously it's not the most extreme end by virtue of actually measuring compliance in the first place. Practitioner adherence. There were no measurements of protocol adherence, and no adherence-approving strategies were employed. Most pragmatic approach possible. 
analysis of the outcome. All randomized patients were included in the primary analysis. Patients who failed to meet the criteria for successful treatment were classified as failures. So extremely pragmatic. And if you are to, were to plot those elements here, this is what it might look like. And so you see this pragmatic trial is represented by a very wide uh, picture. And you can see the points where you know eligibility was a little bit less pragmatic because of the, of the fewer sites involved. So the next example is, is a more uh, explanatory one. It's the North American Symptomatic Carotid and Arterectomy Trial. And sort of focused on, on the severe stenosis piece. This question was among patients with symptomatic uh, 70 to 99% stenosis of a carotid artery, uh, can the addition of carotid and arterectomy to best medical therapy compared with best medical therapy alone reduce the outcomes of major stroke or death over the next two years? So the experimental intervention was carotid and arterectomy. <clears throat> so let's go through the criteria. Eligibility. So symptomatic patients were stratified for carotid artery, uh, carotid stenosis severity. Primary interest in severe stenosis, the high risk group. They were thought to be most likely to respond if it was efficacious. The, the higher stenosis, higher risk of subsequent stroke. And if you clear away that stenosis, the most likely to benefit. Um, there was no prior compliance testing, but there was many exclusion criteria. And it's very near the extreme explanatory end of the scale. Um, I worked on this trial. It's one of the first ones I worked on after I finished school. And there, I, I can attest to the fact there were many, many exclusion criteria. So it was a very, very select population. The intervention flexibility. Now, endarterectomy had to be carried out rather than stenting or some other operation. But the surgeon was given leeway in how it was performed. So the surgical technique was not dictated, but they had to do the endarterectomy. There were some things that were not allowed. They couldn't do uh, uh, cabbage at the same time. And if they were doing a bilateral uh, carotid endarterectomy, they had to do the symptomatic side first. So a couple restrictions or instructions on you know, how to do certain things. The same co-interventions. Um, as best medical care in, for, for the medical, uh, their medical care was the same as the medical group as best medical care. So it's very explanatory, but it could be more so if you specify, for example, certain details of what had to be done in the surgery. Um, for example, surgeons were given complete leeway in terms of the type of anesthetic they wanted to use, various types, you know, how they wanted to did they want to put the patient on bypass, or did they want to, uh, you know, did they, did they want to shunt them? Did all sorts of uh, choices made, whether they were going to use vein patches or so many surgical decisions were left up to the surgeon. The expertise. So surgeons had to be approved by an expert panel and were restricted to those who performed at least 50 endarterectomies in the last 24 months with a post-operative complication rate of less than 6%. So we say this is extremely, extremely explanatory because really we're taking high quality surgeons with a demonstrated high level of competence in the procedure. Follow-up assessments were carried out by board certified neurologists or their senior subspecialty trainees. A slightly less explanatory approach, but still, still far from usual practice or usual care that might might be seen. The comparison intervention. So all patients were prescribed antiplatelet therapy. It was usually uh, 1,300 milligrams of aspirin per day. 
that was the standard at this time. Co-interventions applied to surgical patients were also applied to control patients. So antihypertensive therapy, blood pressure targets and feedback, antilipid and antidiabetic therapy as indicated. So all of these were the pieces that were being managed, so all of the, the usual risk factors for recurrent stroke. So strongly explanatory. Um, it was dictated what patients should be, should be uh, what should be done to patients. Um, and there wasn't a lot of, you know, it was expected that this was done. The practitioner expertise, patients in the medical arm managed and followed by board certified neurologists, so they're senior specialty trainees, just like surgical patients. So it's explanatory approach. The follow-up intensity. Patients had pre-scheduled appointments at 1, 3, 6, 9, 12, 16, 20, and 24 months, and every four months thereafter. They consisted of medical, neurologic, and functional status assessments. All blood pressure records were reviewed centrally, and elevated readings triggered reminder letters. So it's a, in a highly explanatory approach. Lots of visits and lots of data collection. The outcome. The primary outcome was timed to its lateral stroke the clinically relevant explanatory outcome most likely to be affected by endarterectomy. Other outcomes are more pragmatic, all strokes, major strokes, mortality, et cetera. Very explanatory again. Participant compliance. Experimental intervention, the surgery is a one-time operation. Because the 50% probability of operation was clearly stated in the consent. Patients who didn't want surgery were unlikely to enter the trial. And in fact, only 0.3% of admitted patients refused the operation. So in, in, a, in a sense, that was a prophylactic strategy for achieving compliance, certainly to the experimental intervention, and is thus an explanatory approach. Practitioner adherence. So the completeness, timeliness, accuracy of Clinical data forms it was monitored centrally and deficiency would result in more frequent visits from the PI. Blood pressure reports from each visit were scrutinized centrally with letters pestering uh, collaborators when they were elevated. Extremely explanatory. So we've got two levels of adherence, you know, just following the protocol, getting data in, and in particular dealing with uh, hypertensive of patients in as real time as possible. Uh, analysis of the primary outcome was restricted to fatal and non-fatal strokes affecting the operated side of the cerebral circulation. So blinded adjudicators removed three patients after randomization because the review of the pre-randomization data revealed they had other explanations or were inoperable. Uh, patients were not excluded if they did not have a carotid endarterectomy or had uncontrolled blood pressure. So it's an explanatory approach. Um, the, it's not mentioned here, but the primary outcomes were also, they actually received two levels of adjudication. They received a blinded adjudication by the steering committee, and then they received a, a second external blinded adjudication. And all of these have to be effectively resolved. So this is the result of putting this on the diagram and you see the very tight focus around the explanatory hub. All right. So we'll... Uh, so we questions. have a couple questions, um, Professor Thorpe. One question that comes to my mind in your 10 domains and the various trade-offs that you've articulated so well and purposeful choices is in the design of these studies, to what extent have you encountered modifications of choices along each domain in order to meet uh, the needs of IRB approval uh, for going forward? Are there particular domains such as the um, participant compliance um, that may adjust the actual um, questions posed and the intent of the study? Have you experienced that? Hmm. 
Yeah. Um, I guess it's hard to hard to say. I mean, you know, the you know we have uh, REBs here, and they can be a real pain in the butt um, because they don't they sometimes don't uh, don't get the big picture. Obviously, um, sometimes it takes some explanation back and forth to convey why certain decisions are being made. Um, but I suppose yeah, it, it is possible that in order to get permission to run a trial, you might have to make modifications to satisfy a review board that make it less than what you had originally aimed for. Um, and I don't know that there's any any way around that. But the advantage, I suppose, of having thought through it up front is when you need to make those changes, you're aware of what it could possibly be doing to the to the interpretation to the trial design itself. Thank you. Another thought that I have, having sat through a lot of grant reviews and felt sorry for the applicants whose application is being discussed, when the reviewers are hoping um, that the application can bring more information than could be possible with a modest uh, grant funding, you know, even 1.5 million in a few years. Um, and I'm hoping that your phrasing and framing of the research design and the intended uh, output um, will be picked up by both the applicant community and the reviewers um, to provide a sense of a reality check. Are there other uh, strategies or insights you could share with folks on how they can present their selection of um, a particular trial design in terms of um, being compelling and it gets at the question sought at the next step needed for this particular continuum of uh, whatever the particular topic is? Or is that just too general? It might be too general, but I, I guess what I would offer is is by sort of thinking through the goals, it comes down to really sort of being very explicit in, about what you are trying to achieve. So what is the question that you're trying to answer? Um, what, what you ultimately hope to, uh, hope to come away with? Um, I think some of the experience that we're seeing here in Canada um, is policymakers tend to like the sort of the pragmatic approach a little bit more because you know provided you're you know looking at outcomes that they care about they you know they you know they don't they want to know if if you implement if implement a particular policy to do a particular treatment what is the population effect going to be on that, uh, and so with, you know, especially with with the, uh, the the healthcare model in Canada, where it's um, it's paid for by by government, they want to know whether we should, should we pay for this new treatment or not, and so the pragmatic designs are quite appealing to them for those sorts of questions. Um, so I don't. So that is sort of some of the experience we've had here. In order to, you just really have to be able to make, I think, the right case that this, you know, what is the question you're trying to answer? What is the target audience? Uh, the, sort of the target audience, um, and by that I mean sort of the target patient population. Is it very specific? Is it very general? Um, and it may often be the case that you're not ready to jump straight into the pragmatic trial. You don't know enough about things like safety. Um, you don't know enough about things like do people comply with, with these interventions. And so if you've done the groundwork that sort of says, yeah, you know, we know that these are safe, we know that people will take them to an acceptable level, then in the pragmatic design where you're expanding it a bit more, you say, you know, we've got evidence that, that these things are used. So we're not going to monitor it extensively in this trial. Um, I don't know if that helps, but those are just uh, some, some thoughts on that. 
Great, thank you. Um, we have a compounded question, but a good one. Once you have plotted and viewed the summary diagram, do you consider it preliminary descriptive, or is it analytical and actionable in some way? And if so, how would you respond to that diagram once you've created it? I think I get at that a little bit in the discussion, but you know, the idea is, as I see it, is where this can where this can work is if all members of a trial design team generate their own diagrams. Okay, they're not all going to look exactly the same. And so one level here is by taking a look at where folks on a, on a steering committee disagree, that implies areas to focus in. Now, so that's one element. Another element then, say you have consensus on something. It may be actionable, it may not. It really depends on, on the particular situation. Um, you may, the advantage I think is you may think that you're doing a pragmatic design and then when you go and you know, take a look at the result, you discover, oh, well, wait a minute, this is really more explanatory than I thought it was. So you, you sort of say, well, do we need to relax certain things or do we need to sort of rethink what our focus is? Um, other things that can I suppose show you is inconsistency in your treatment of various domains. If something is not consistently explanatory permit across the domains, it's hard to know whether your trial is explanatory or pragmatic. So, you know, those are some of the types of uh, types of things that it informs you about. about how consistent you've been with your aims. Do you need to change your aims or do you need to take another look at those areas that were not consistent? And I think that you, you, may, you may find that, well, you know, there's nothing we can really do about some of these aims. There's nothing we can do about some of these domains. So you have, um, you, it might be actionable, it might not, but it's certainly informative. Great, thank you. So here we're going back, and I know this is hard to convey because you're not seeing these. Um, Professor Thorpe, but we're going back to one of the earlier questions and I'm going to provide a prelude for, hope for clarification and get your response. Um, the participant says that he thought that he understood that in a pragmatic approach you do not seek information about patients who are lost to follow-up. Is this correct? Yeah, no, I, I don't think, I don't think that's ideal. Um, you, I think in any trial situation you want to obtain as much information as you can, uh, even in patients who are lost to follow up. Um, so how you go about getting that, I suppose, and your plans for doing that are, are going to be somewhat related to the follow up intensity approaches and some of the other domains perhaps. You know, no matter which type of design it, you're in, missing, you know, lost to follow up is is a horrible thing and creates all you know all sorts of unpleasant biases. So I I think you you still want to to do your best, and that's I guess why in some of these really extreme pragmatic situations where you're not following patients at all, you're able you don't actually end up with lost to follow up with admin data. Um, but you know, it's to be. A, you do have to. Uh, you do have. To, I mean, I think the bottom line is you want to try and get your follow up done, um, even in the pragmatic trial. Okay. Um, this is a variation on that theme. Um, assuming that you're conducting a superiority trial. Uh, and you're using a pragmatic strategy, um, is your guidance that you would not use an intention to treat approach? Yes, yeah. for superiority, I, w I think intention to treat is still the right thing to use. 
Okay, great. It's um, the non-inferiority and equivalence where it's contrary. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we have a reflection um, of someone seeking confirmation if they have a, a grasp on the, the main theme, um, where they state, oversimplifying perhaps, but can we say pragmatic is tracking and explanatory is measuring? Um, I'm not sure I'd characterize it like that. Um, I mean, both are measuring in a way, it's just you're measuring something different. Um, and I sort of look at it this way. Pragmatic, you're measuring whether it works. In explanatory, you're measuring why it works. Okay, thank you. Um, well, that's all the questions that we have posed. Um, are there other, so I know you have references. Uh, well, there's, I still have a few discussion slides oh, to go. Please do, excuse me. So I can all proceed with those now. So just to, to wrap up some thoughts. Yeah, now, I say it's a work in process. It's fairly, you know, been a while now. And in fact, there, uh, there are, has a group that has sort of now, now worked on uh, an update that they're, they've called Crazy 2. Um, I, won't, I can't say much more about it at this point. Um, but we'll, we'll see how, uh, how that works. They, you know, tried to take the, uh, the same flavor, but, but improve, the, you know, improve the use of it in some respects. So Now, I view this as a tool to be used by design team during the planning stages of a trial. Um, now, although in both cases of the examples presented, I applied it retrospectively, I had some insider knowledge. I worked on NASA, so I knew that protocol like the back of my hand. Uh, one of the co-eyes or co-authors on it worked on the DOT trial, so he knew it. So, you know, knowing the protocol in detail allows you to do this. It's very difficult to do these sorts of assessments on the amount of information typically reported in publications. Um, so it's really intended to be used during the design and planning stages of a trial to sort of see are you is your are you designing your trial fit for its intended purpose. We found the graphical representations helpful for readily identifying domains that are not as pragmatic or explanatory as a trial designer is desired. So you, see, you know, sort of we've talked about that a little bit. You know, saying, well we're doing an, an explanatory design. Whoops, what happened to this arm? It's way out here in the middle of nowhere or, or the other way around. So Again, it might, it might be actionable, but it also might just be uh, important to know going forward. Now, perhaps, you know, this is sort of one of the biggest criticisms, but I consider this a feature. There's clearly some subjectivity in placing each domain within a continuum. And I suppose extreme positions are the easiest to identify, while the less extreme positions are more challenging. I actually don't see this as a major problem. I see it, you know, I always saw it more of as a feature. Um, since the design team, yeah, the idea is the entire team is working on this, those domains where agreement is hard to achieve seems to me to be exactly the domains that need the most attention to make sure they're unambiguous in what is intended. So from that standpoint, using this tool as a you know, with a number of individuals on your design team evaluating it with respect to all those domains, where everybody agrees, there's not much work to do, unless, of course, you agree and it was way off of your target. That's another story. But those where there's a lot of ambiguity will show up as a lot of disagreement about where to place the dot on that particular spoke. And that highlights those elements of the protocol that the trial's design that need a bit more work to make it clear where they really fit. So that sort of discussion, those are the, I guess, the references for everything uh, here this afternoon.
Uh, we thank you so much, Professor Thorpe, and um, this has been a delightful and in-depth presentation. Um, and we look forward to um, sharing this with our broader community when we have a YouTube video of it available. Um, we had one last question, if we might pose it to you. Um, uh, one of the uh, participants was wondering um, if there's an optimal way or succession for completion. Uh, might first you do explanatory, then pragmatic. And um, I'll, she posed that. Um, I have a slightly different twist on that, if you could answer both. Is, has it been your experience, are you in allowing to have a rather um, uh, explanatory study that can be considered a proof of concept for the intervention itself, but keeping those observations as you move towards a pragmatic design? I mean, I certainly think that uh, proof of proof of concept are, is often going to be, in some respects, more explanatory in that you're looking for a preliminary treatment effect, perhaps. Um, so that's often going to, you know, that that might be the case. Um, it's always a little bit tougher, you know, the when you're going from the explanatory to the pragmatic. Lots of things can change in terms of how you're going to implement interventions. Um, so, you know, that can be a, they sometimes don't, don't connect as well as you would like. Um, so it's, it is a, it's often, it may often be a stepping stone, but there may be times when it's not. Um, so, you know, a, uh, as, consider an example. Um, There's some suggestions that certain probiotics given in, in hospitals to people on antibiotics are going to help you know, prevent certain forms of, uh, you know, of complications such as uh, C. difficile. So you, you might be able to sort of do proof of concept on a patient level basis, but really to evaluate um, a strategy of Supplementing antibiotics with a probiotic would require a rather different type of design where you'd it'd be very difficult to do that sort of thing on a patient level. You'd be looking more at a cluster randomized trial. So the way it would be implemented in a pragmatic trial could be extremely different from the way which you might implement in a proof of concept trial. Thank you. Um, so with that, um, if um, Christina, if you could exit you execute the concluding polling questions. Um, again, this will help us understand whether or not these webinars are successful and the type of content we should be pursuing. So the first question is, which for some of you who have never participated before, um, you won't be able to address it, we we'll want to know whether or not the webinars, this one, or historically, collectively, the webinars you participated in, are a trusted source of information with respect to practice improvement and practice transformation, if you find these helpful. And you can choose one of your options. Strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. And I ask you to take the time to evaluate because Dr. Kurdick, we have to have everything that demonstrates our relative impact or not. So this is helpful and if it isn't uh, process isn't helpful, we need to know that too. And then we have the second poll. Uh, we're ready for our second poll, I believe, in a moment. The second poll is currently up and launched. Great, thank you. So um, while folks are responding, Professor Thorpe, um, in your conceptualization of pre 2 that we get to know about, so we'll keep an eye out, but uh, you can't reveal the content to us, how will we learn more about it? Where should we be keeping an eye for more information about pre 2 um, Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it's been submitted to a journal at this point, and that's probably about what I can say. So maybe we can uh, 
send you a tick or email maybe sometime in the spring and hopefully get good news about update of your plan publication. Would that be reasonable? Uh, sure. I'm not the lead author on this one, so it, uh, I've been more peripherally involved, but we'll see how it, uh, how it shapes up. Great. And the other polling question is out. Are PBRN Resource Center webinars facilitate collaboration among interested parties? So does this information help you connect with one another? Let us know. This is our last polling question. Okay, and um, Christina will go over the um, description of what one needs to do if one wants to file for continuing education credits for this presentation. Thank you. So thank you all for attending today's PBRN webinar. This live series activity, the Arts Practice Based Research Network Resource Center National Webinars has been reviewed and, and is acceptable for credit by the American Academy of Family Physicians. This webinar has been approved for 1.25 elective CME credit. <laughs> to obtain CME credit for your participation in this webinar, I just jumped ahead. Please complete the online evaluation and you'll be prompted to do so when you exit the webinar. Then please email us at pbrn at abtassoc.com to request a copy of your CME Certificate of Participation. Then we invite you to join us for two upcoming events. Our next PBRN Resource Center webinar will be on January 28th from 12.30 to 2 p.m. Eastern and the title is Practic Practical Insights on Meaning Objectives of, mean of Meaningful Use 3. We also invite you to join the PBRN Pragmatic Research and Translation Learning Group call on January 5th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. For more information on upcoming events, you can visit our website, which is listed on this slide. <clears throat> and additionally, we're currently planning for and scheduling additional webinars on topics of interest. So if you'd like to present on one of these topics, or if you'd like to suggest additional webinar topics, please send your feedback to pbrn at abtassoc.com. And just you're not, to, yes. Thank you. So just to let you know, we are scheduling with some Canadians and Dr. Miriam Dickinson a wonderful presentation about step wedge approach where we will have a similar structure as Professor Thorpe has done for us today with Pre-C and we will also have some pre-recorded examples of detailed examples. So we're very excited to keep bringing you both methodology and findings and we'll be working on some other webinars with respect to strategies for um, enhancing organization of PBRNs as well. So I want to thank Professor Thorpe and I want to thank the team um, in APT for supporting this well-conducted uh, webinar and thank you all for joining. Um, Professor Thorpe did a fabulous job of keeping everyone's attention and engagement, and thank you for those folks who posed their questions. All right. Thank you, and have a good day.